In the last video, I talked about how man in the browser malware basically waits for a user to visit a particular website with their browser, uh, such as let's say their bank's website, and basically intercepts and modifies the data that goes between a website or web browser and a user. And that might include transaction details and even transaction confirmation details as well. In this video, I want to touch upon some of the mechanics by which man in the browser malware is able to actually intercept and modify this traffic between a user and their web browser. Now the main technique, the most common technique that we've seen employed by man in the browser attacks is known as API hooking. And the best way to explain API hooking is by diving in and really giving a concrete example. So imagine you have a user and, and let's say the user is uh, using their computer and their computer has a, a web browser on it. Let me mark the web browser in blue. Okay. And let's say in this particular case, to make it more concrete, let's say they're using Internet Explorer as their web browser and they're using Internet Explorer uh, to connect to the internet. So let's label the internet as a cloud. Okay, and maybe somewhere on the internet is their bank's website. And we'll mark that with a dollar sign. So this is their bank's website. And really what's happening is Internet Explorer is going to be used to connect to the internet. Now when an internet connection is initiated, let's say it's a connection between Internet Explorer and the rest of the internet, it turns out that Internet Explorer calls a very standard a Windows function known, actually it's called Internet Connect. It's a Windows function that's basically used for connecting to the internet. Uh, this is a function that's implemented inside of Windows and the actual code for this function is contained in a special dynamically loaded library or, or DLL. Uh, and in fact, the name of this DLL is WinInet. WinInet, really you can think of it as WinInternet but it's called WinInet.dll. And this particular DLL is part of every standard Windows installation. It, it basically is designed to allow applications to communicate over uh, well-known internet protocols, protocols like FTP and HTTP and so on and so forth, without having to worry about all of the underlying mechanics and nuances of how these protocols are implemented and work at a low level. So really, Internet Connect, this Internet Connect function represents what's known as an application programmer interface. And you might actually have heard this term, or maybe you're more familiar with the term API, which is an acronym. And this acronym stands for application programmer interface. And really this interface, this API allows the programmer of an application, let's say the programmer of internet explorer, or really any other application for that matter that wants to connect to the internet. It allows the programmer to get essentially more easy to use, access maybe an easier interface into code for performing more complex behaviors like communicating over a network without having to worry about how to do that under that low level behavior it can use the interface to implement that behavior without having to worry about the mechanics of, of how it works underneath so it's really a nice very useful black box a useful abstraction so a man in the browser malware can basically try to hook this api and actually hooking is a technical term it's, it's used among uh, technical folks, it basically means it really denotes techniques whereby data transmitted to an API will instead pass through an attacker's code, or really pass through some other code before the actual API is called. So in effect, what's happening is code that maybe this thing, this thing, Internet Explorer might have been calling something rather than doing when INET directly, um, some other code will be called instead of when INET. Okay. And in this sense, what's happening is if you are an attacker and you're able to hook an API, you are basically able now to more or less fully control the interaction between WinInet.dll and Internet Explorer. And, and that really entails, that really implies that you can now control the interaction between the user and the web browser. Because if you can control what the web browser is doing, what functionality the web browser calls, you effectively have co-opted the web browser, which means that you have effectively co-opted what view the user sees of the world when they interact with their web browser. Because again, this is happening underneath the hood. It's all surreptitious. The user doesn't know this is happening. So let me actually be a bit more concrete and, and give you a bit of an example of how to hook an API. So one way you can hook an API 
is by having the malware modify the uh, the preamble or the prototype or the beginning of the actual module being called. So for example, in this case, let's say that uh, when Windows Internet Explorer will call Internet Connect, Internet Connect, as I mentioned earlier, is located um, inside of a DLL known as WinInet.dll. And let me uh, actually let me use a different color to denote uh, WinInet.dll. I'll, I'll make it orange. Okay. What's going to happen is that the attacker's code is going to modify the very beginning of WinInet.dll. Or really, in particular, it's going to modify the very beginning of InternetConnect.dll. So that rather than when rather than doing the functionality that's included in Internet Connect, when Internet Connect is called, let's say Internet Connect is called by Internet Explorer, the beginning is going to say, you know what, instead of doing what's in here, first transfer control to code that's located at a different location in memory. In this case, what this code will do is basically have the computer, instead of executing what's inside of when inet.dll, it's going to have the computer execute code that's located here. This is, let's say, the attacker's code. Then after the attacker's code is executed, then control can be passed back to the original module after the point at which the original code is modified. So really, the computer is now being instructed to examine code that's been placed at a different location in memory, and this is the attacker's code. Okay, The attacker's code can now, in this process, can be used to obviously manipulate the interaction, it can be used to actually manipulate the data that was meant for the original module. Once the attacker's code has been executed, control can be passed back to the original module that was called. So just to kind of reiterate to make this crystal clear, what's happening is that the attacker effectively has intercepted a system call and amended its behavior, amended the data that went into that call, and then passed control back. Now this is one mechanism by which you can perform hooking. In fact, the technique I've just described, albeit I, I did describe it at a very, very high level, this technique is known as uh, inline hooking. And you can actually look this up separately if you're interested. Uh, there are other techniques for doing hooking. Uh, for example, there's a technique known as import address table or IAT hooking, uh, which is very popular uh, for a lot of malware. Um, by the way, inline hooking, I want to point out, is used by examples, uh, for example, Zeus, which is a very popular man in the browser Trojan, or really a banking Trojan, uses inline hooking. Um, IAT hooking is very popular. You see it in rootkits all the time. Uh, another technique is, is for hooking is called uh, binary patching. Uh, and and there, are, there are many, many techniques for hooking. Actually, I did a series of videos on rootkits, a series of chalk talks on rootkits, and I discuss some of these hooking techniques in more detail in those videos on rootkits. And I would encourage you to watch those videos if you want more detail on the mechanics of various types of hooking techniques. But suffice it to say, at a very high level, there are a host of techniques for hooking APIs. And API hooking just amounts to a way by which an application will unknowingly, or maybe unbeknownst to the application or the programmer of the application, execute other code when it calls a particular system API. Okay. Now given that API hooking is, is so powerful, it, it's obviously something that a malware author can use to modify what's happening at a low level on the system in a way that nobody's realizing what's going on and really realizing that, that, that their transactions are being modified, that their data is being amended in the process. You might be wondering why the operating system itself doesn't just try to detect and block any form of API hooking. And the reason is that API hooking turns out to have many legitimate purposes as well. Uh, so for example, a lot of, of security software, okay, will use API hooking. Um, to do things like security checks. Uh, if you have, let's say, instant messaging software, instant messaging applications often use API hooking to see if a user is typing on their keyboard. So they can then convey that information to the person with whom the user is communicating. So just trying to detect API hooking and using that as the only mechanism by which you look for malicious activity, that's not going to work very well for blocking these types of man in the browser attacks. All right. So essentially what I've said in this video is that man in the browser attacks are typically implemented using API hooking. API hooking is just a way by which uh, data is manipulated between uh, a user and an application, and really not just between the user and an application. It's really the manipulation is happening between an application and maybe lower level uh, system calls that application makes. But the, the upshot remains that the 
interaction has been now corrupted between the, the user and that application. So given all of what I've said, you might now be wondering, you know, given that you can't just try to block API hooking as a vehicle for trying to uh, detect or prevent man in the browser attacks, you might not be wondering what existing approaches are out there for detecting and blocking these types of attacks. What I will do is I will cover that in the next video.